Well, the building is coming along, and I was over there this last week, and once again standing in that in that auditorium, and just thinking, Lord, this is so much bigger than I am. And I was looking around this morning just to just gather here first hour, and we have had such a precious decade here in the barn. And I'm, I'm find myself torn between past and future, what God has done and what God is about to do. But what is the Lord doing right now? And I wanted to ask you all a question and ask you to be praying about this and really thinking about this. And that is, what are we going to do with what he's doing? What are we going to do with what he's engaged in? Because the reality is, this new facility, is, it's just a building. But what many of us see the Lord doing in this process is a lot bigger than us. It's much bigger than us. And if it were dependent upon us to pull it off, that is to move into that facility and to fill it up and to to bring people to the Lord, if it was dependent upon you and me, we'd be in trouble. But it's not. So the question is, what are you willing to do with what he's doing? How are you going to be involved in the work that God has called us to? Because he has called us to something that is huge. And we need to all understand, we are wrapped up in something very, very big. It struck me again this last week that we're about to open up, and you can turn to the book of Amos if you'd like to. We're going to open up the next of the minor prophets, Amos. And I'm reading the life of Amos and studying the words that God poured out through him and thinking about Joel and Hosea before him and Daniel and, and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all the prophets. In fact, this morning earlier, I was jotting down all of the prophets listed in Scripture. I'll give you a list in a week or two. But I'm going through and I'm thinking about... Who were all the prophets and how many prophets did God call and how amazing their lives were? You read about Elijah, you know, going head to head with the prophets of Baal. You read about Daniel thrown into the lion's den. You read about Ezekiel there with the exiles in Babylon. And it's just, you're you're kind of stunned, almost starstruck. I am far more starstruck by the prophets than I am by anybody coming out of Hollywood, I can tell you that. (laughs) And I look at the prophets and I think, wow, Lord, you did amazing things. Incredible times. I would have loved to have been there. I would have signed up for the school of the prophets there with Elijah. Just to be in that class. And he said, Rick, it's no different right now. In fact, it may even be more important right now than it's ever been for this world. Because things are winding down. And we are at a critical time in the history of the world. And we have two options here. We can go along bumping through life, ignorant of everything God is doing, or we can jump on board and say, yes, Lord, to whatever you want. Yes, Lord, to whatever you're going to do. Yes, Lord, we will fill up this new facility with people who are messed up because they need Jesus. Yes, Lord, we will call and invite and draw any. Yes, Lord, we will become all things to all people so that we might win a few for Christ. And that's where my heart is right now. Caught in between the past and the future of the Bridge Christian Fellowship, just thinking, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever you need to do. And that's going to make us a bit uncomfortable because in here we know each other. And in here the chairs are comfortable and the weirdos are outside. (laughs) And if you believe that, look around. I know, I'm hearing the joking already. Just remember that we are among the prophets, we are the people of God. And we are called to be his priests, his royal priesthood in this age until the close of this age. And then we're called to something even more marvelous. Let's open up to the book of Amos. That was free this morning. That's just on my heart. And I want you all to be praying about that and asking the Lord, what is what is my part? Amos chapter one, verse one. We are, we are in the juggernaut of the end of the Hebrew Scriptures. I mean, we are flying through these prophets. Amos chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, when he envisioned envisions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. 
He said, the Lord roars from Zion and from Jerusalem. He utters his voice and the shepherds pasture grounds mourn and the summit of Carmel dries up. And we'll hold it right there. Let's pray. Father, as we open up this new book in the scriptures, I pray you'll give us insight and understanding and knowledge, Lord, not just of the scriptures, but knowledge of God, knowledge of your heart. May we be filled with the wisdom of your spirit and understanding, Lord. May we know more of the grace of Jesus. And I pray that you will, in these words, your timing has has always been so good, Father. Always perfect. I pray in the timing of these words for this fellowship, for us here today, that you will equip us for what we need in coming days. Strengthen our hearts, Father. May they be soft but strong. And may we hear from your Spirit today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Unlike the book of Joel... And we just finished, Amos immediately opens up with some very helpful and informative background information. There in chapter 1, verse 1, about midway through, we're told that he envisioned envisions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, you may recall with Joel, we were not really sure when Joel was written, probably around 840 or so, 835 B.C., but we didn't really know. There's some uncertainty that comes with with the study of the book of Joel. Amos, we know exactly when he wrote. We We can tag it literally to the year. To the year. Two and a half centuries after uh Amos wrote his prophecy. The Lord referred to this exact earthquake. Note he says this, two years before the earthquake is when he wrote. So if we could find out something of this earthquake, we can know when he wrote. Obviously, we know that it was during the days of Uzziah and Jeroboam. So that narrows it down to within a 40, 50 year period that we're certain of. But when was this earthquake? Two and a half centuries later, Zechariah wrote, You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So Zechariah tells us there was an earthquake in the days of Uzziah. A major earthquake, so massive that the people were running scared because of it. Ever been in an earthquake? How many of you have been in an earthquake? Okay, a number of us. Good. Ever been in uh, like a 7.0? How many 7.0ers there? All right, the 7.0 club. Excellent. I was in San Francisco in 1989, 90, when the 7.0 hit. I was there. I had just arrived an hour earlier on a flight for a youth pastor's convention. I had moved out of state. I was so glad to be out of California. (laughs) Fly back into the state, meet my brother. We're going to this convention and sixth floor of the hotel. I've told the story before and the place was shaken and rocked and it was unbelievable. We know there was an earthquake in the days of Uzziah. The Bible tells us, Amos mentions it, Zechariah mentions it. Someone might say, yeah, yeah, it's in the Bible. But you got any proof of that, Pastor? Any proof that there was some big old earthquake? As a matter of fact, in 1955, archaeologist Yigal Yavin, an Israeli archaeologist, excavated Hatzor, which was Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel's largest ancient city. He also excavated the city of Samaria, capital of northern Israel. And in these excavations, his team uncovered proof of a devastating earthquake. Tilted walls, inclined pillars, collapsed houses, items of daily use crushed beneath fallen ceilings, evidence, strong evidence of an earthquake undisputably dated 760 B.C., which is right smack in the middle of the days of Uzziah and the days of Jeroboam. 760 B.C., and over 50 years of ongoing digs in hot sore has just unearthed more proof of earthquake damage. It only took science 2,715 years to catch up to the Bible that told us this had happened. And it's funny, if you read commentators before 1955, all of them will tell you, we don't know when this earthquake was. But in 1955, the Lord said, I'll tell you where it was. 
I'll tell you when it was. So if it happened in 760 B.C., then Amos is telling us that this was two years before the earthquake. We can date the book of Amos in 762 B.C. 762. By the way, that's also within a generation, roughly 40 years, in fact, exactly 40 years until the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. So as Amos is penning his book, we are 40 years away from the absolute destruction and driving out of the people of northern Israel. And you might note that he says the visions are concerning Israel. So the visions of the prophet Amos are all about the northern kingdom. Amos is called to preach to, to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel 40 years before its destruction, two years after or two years before the earthquake. I find that interesting, by the way. He says he gave the prophecy two years before the earthquake. Did he write it two years before the earthquake? And if so, how did he know? That he's writing it two years before the earthquake. Prophet. (laughs) Perhaps he wrote it down afterwards. I don't know. But we know when this was written. And he wrote it concerning Israel. There truly comes a point of no return when it comes to sin. And people have asked before, because I've said this before, well, when is that point of no return? The point of no return is when you are no longer willing to repent. So if you are in a place where you're saying, have I gone too far? Is this one sin too many? Ask yourself, is your heart broken over it? Are you returning to the Lord? Do you feel the shame and the guilt and the repentance that comes with that? Then it's not the final sin. It's not the point of no return for you but be awfully careful because when the point of no return comes I don't think people even know the heart gets so hard it gets so calloused it gets so seared that there's a point when there will be no repentance you wouldn't repent you wouldn't think of it I'm not saying you but a person wouldn't consider repentance and northern Israel was there in the days of Amos Chapter 2, verse 6, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Now, we'll see this on Wednesday night, but there's a Hebrew phrase here for three transgressions and for four. He'll use this phrase eight times for three and for four, for three and for four. He will use it about eight different nations in chapter two. The last one being the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. What does that mean for three and for four? It means one sin too many. And for four is the last straw. And if you're a note taker this morning, jot that down. Israel had sinned the last straw. This was the straw that would break the camel's back. Burdens for eight nations. Aram, Philistia, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and Israel. And Israel gets the last and the longest judgment in chapter 2. And then the judgment of Israel continues all the way through the end of the book of Amos. They reach the tipping point. So what was going on? Let me give you a little background. In the times and the days of Amos when he wrote, you might be surprised at the state of Israel. This is kind of a state of Israel address at the time. Three primary assumptions among the people who had reached the tipping point, who had sinned one sin too many, who had reached the last straw, and yet didn't even know. First of all, it was a time of regional security. Regional security. It's all good. Northern Kingdom literally was at the height of its power under Jeroboam II. He had successfully expanded Israel's borders to the north up beyond Tyre, and, and out to the east, out over the whole area of Aram, they had pushed back. And the people felt good about the nation. What can happen to us? <laughs> Truth was, Assyria was just preoccupied at the moment with some other uh, internal and external struggles. But it still had its eye on Israel. Israel was in the crosshairs, though they didn't know it. With this enlarged territory, this regional security, Israel controlled significant trade routes. And because of the control of these trade routes, Israel was secondly in a time of great riches. This was the wealthiest time for the northern kingdom. As we learned with Hosea, 
who, by the way, was prophesying at the same time, the prophecies of Amos were juxtaposed, just wanted to use that word, were juxtaposed against the prosperity of both Judah and Israel. The divided kingdoms were both doing very well. They both had been under long administrations. Uzziah was king of Judah for 51 years. So there was a long time of peace and tranquility and strength and wealth under Uzziah in Judah in the south. And in the north, Jeroboam II was king for 40 years. Can you imagine an administration lasting 40 years? Please no. (laughs) And yet, regional security, stability, riches... And there's a principle here that is as old as the first paycheck. The more we have, the less we think we need God. Regional security and riches. You know the attitude in Israel. Lots of money, lots of righteousness. We must be doing something right if we're in good financial uh, situation. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Paul wrote to young Pastor Tim, and he said, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. Note, he didn't say those who are rich. He said those who want to get rich. That could include people who are rich. It can also include people who are impoverished, but really think about money all the time. So no one's exempt. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, don't turn off here. Oftentimes we hear something that we've heard many, many times. We kind of set it aside or we say, okay, we'll wait for the next point because I know this. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Heard it, been there, done that, know that. Hang on. Don't deny to apply. The love of money is an incredibly subtle trap and I speak as one who has been caught in that trap business home church when the love of money seeps in what happens along with the obvious issues of greed and covetousness and and envy what happens when we start to really pursue wealth when we desire riches is we develop a false sense of security we really start to believe that the security is in how much we have amassed in terms of our wealth, in terms of our holdings, in terms of our our finances. And that false sense of financial security, it deafens the ears. And it dulls the heart. And it is a great danger. It was for northern Israel. Oh, we have regional security. We're at peace. We've got riches. We must be right. And Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.17, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. I don't think the dollar has ever been more uncertain than it is right now. You know what backs up the dollar? Air. Well, I thought the federal government did. Air. There is nothing supporting the dollar. Tradition, history, that has been strong for, for many, many decades, perhaps. But there's not much strength behind it, gang. Regional security, riches. And finally, I think the most amazing assumption in Israel was that of, number three, religion. Religion. <laughs> After all, they had Gilgal. Gilgal was home of the famed school of the prophets. You can read about the sons of the prophets in Scripture, how they were trained by Elijah, trained by Elisha. And they all resided there in Gilgal. School of the prophets. I I thought, you know, it's amazing. People love to have their ears tickled with prophecy, even if that prophecy is not from the Lord. Just the idea. Ooh, something out there. And so, religiously speaking, false prophecy flourished. In the northern kingdom. They had Gilgal. They had Bethel. Of course, Bethel. Wow, that that was the center of worship in the kingdom. There was another center up north in Dan, but Bethel was the main center for the kingdom of Israel. And in Dan and Bethel both, you know what they had? Golden calves. 
a big golden calf that the people made sacrifice to and offered to in the north, the golden calf there at Bethel in the south. And the Lord in Amos and through Amos is going to denounce a people who were gung-ho for their religion. They were religious, they were spiritual, they had their feasts, they had their festivals, they had their sacrifices, they had their offerings, it was all going on. And Amos chapter 4 verse 4, the Lord says, enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Wait a minute, they were tithing? Yeah! Oh yeah, because because everything's good and they're obviously blessed and let's make sure we sacrifice to, to Yahweh and, and the other gods. Do you remember that the golden calf back in the days of Aaron, back at the foot of Mount Horeb, the golden calf was not intended as another god, but was intended as a representation of Yahweh. That's why they, built, they wanted something to look at when they worshipped Yahweh. He said, don't make any graven images. Don't make any images, uh, you know, even that you think might be of me. Keep it simple. Stupid? (laughs) The golden calf was representative. When Jeroboam set up the golden calf in Bethel and the other in Dan, the intention there was, I believe, not another God, but was a representation of God. Because when the kingdom split, obviously Jeroboam didn't want people going down to Jerusalem, to the temple... We might lose people to the southern kingdom. We need to have a center of worship up here, Bethel. And then, of course, Dan, for those who couldn't make it all the way down. And God says, you're going to Bethel, you're sacrificing, you're offering your tithes, you're doing all of this. He says, Amos chapter 4, verse 5, offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened. And proclaim free will offerings and make them known. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. These were all going on at the time. Regional security, riches, and religion. And it was all false. Brian's been talking to you the last Sunday and a couple weeks before that out of the book of Jude, right? Contend for the faith. Because we live right now in a culture and a time that is filled with regional security, riches, and religion. I just gave you a description of America 2014. People thinking, we don't need to do anything but just kind of hole up. We're safe. We're secure right here. Have you seen our borders lately? (laughs) Riches? Hey, we're fine. Just keep pumping money in. No big deal. Religion? I propose that America is more religious than it's ever been. That our country is more spiritual than it's ever been. Not Christian, spiritual. Well, all of these lies constituted a national judgment from the Lord. And with the exception of the last five verses of the book of Amos, the entire prophecy we're about to study has been fulfilled. Now, this is unique because not all the prophets have completely fulfilled prophecy. Much of some of the other prophets are future And we will see that as we come to them. But Amos, with the exception again of the last five verses, all fulfilled. What God said would happen has happened. And so it stands as a testimony of God's judgment, of God's faithfulness. By the way, in 1 Timothy, where the word word tells us, uh, if you are faithless, I will remain faithful for I cannot deny myself. We often think of that in terms of him just being faithful to us in love, and he is. But gang, he's also faithful in judgment because he cannot deny himself. And if he says he's going to judge, he will judge. Why? Because he said it. And because he's faithful to his word. And in this case, we have a testimony of God's faithfulness in the book of Amos. He said, northern Israel, this is what's going to happen. And it happened. We have that proof before us. What about the last five verses of the book? Well, they stand as a testimony of God's amazing grace. And we'll get there. But think for a moment about the position in which this puts the prophet Amos. The name Amos, it means burden. Burden. Thanks a lot, Mom. You know? Was it a a, a long birth process? I don't know. Perhaps it was. I'm naming this child Burden for 19 hours of labor. His name means burden, but it totally fits the calling of the prophet Amos. He carried a heavy message. He bore a weighty prophecy. If Hosea was like a love song, 
and Joel like an air raid siren, then you could say the prophecy of Amos is the lion's roar. The lion's roar. That's number two. The last straw, and now the lion's roar. Look at verse two. He said... The Lord roars from Zion and from Jerusalem. He utters his voice and the shepherds pasture grounds mourn and the summit of Carmel dries up. The voice of God in this day of regional security, of of riches, of religion, the voice of God comes roaring through Amos loud and clear. But not only through Amos. And this is beginning to really fascinate me. I I keep coming back to this again and again. Hosea, at the same time, was prophesying. Hosea chapter 5, verse 14, the Lord says, I will be like a lion to Ephraim, the northern kingdom. And like a young lion to the house of Judah. In other words, that's going to grow over time, ultimately The attack's going to hit Judah as well. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away, and there is none to deliver. Now that was through Hosea. Well, Amos now says, the Lord roars from Zion. But the truth is, there was an entire group, you could say a lion's pride of prophets at this time. A number of prophets, all prophesying. Amos comes charging in right on the heels of Elijah and Elisha. Amos, well, Amos wasn't, but he was among those who perhaps were of the school of the prophets. He joins the ranks of Isaiah, of Micah, of Hosea, of Jonah. All of these guys are prophesying in Israel at the same time. And often we we hear people make the comment, I just wish the Lord would tell us something. Well, look at the prophets. Look at Israel. There were no doubt people in Israel who are saying, if the Lord would just be clear... If he'd just talk to us, if he'd just tell us what he wants. Well, they had the Hebrew Scriptures. They had the prophets. And when we say the prophets, again, the list is long. I just started jotting them down this morning. The list is long. Now, people through whom the Lord was speaking. And all these guys, they're prophesying at the same time. Amos shows up in the days of divine and deliberate download. God's talking to his people. He is loud and clear as in the roar of a lion. And it reminds me of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. He spoke long ago to the the fathers in the prophets in many portions. In many portions. What does that mean? It means he didn't just give them a snack. The Lord served up plate after plate of portions and portents. But the people refused to come to the table. The food was there. The feast of His Word laid out before them, but they wouldn't come to dinner. They wouldn't come and feed. And because they refused to feed on His Word, Amos is the one who tells us in chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea. We might say from sea to shining sea. And from the north even to the east, they will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And there is a spreading famine, you know this, in our land today. And my friends, it is not because there's not enough food. It's not because there's not more than enough of God's word available It's because people are rejecting the portions that God is laying out. People are rejecting what God is setting before us, even as He roars. Over in chapter 3, verse 12, thus says the Lord, Just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the corner of a couch. The picture is of a lion that has just attacked a flock of lambs and is now ripping one away. And the shepherd is trying to save this poor little lamb and might get a drumstick. It's, it's a bloody picture. Or might get oh, a little piece of ear. And God says, this is what is coming. Israel is about to be savagely devoured by Assyria and the few escapees that would get away would be like a leg of lamb (laughs) or an ear why did Israel reject the food that was all around them 
that was being set out that was clear? How could they not hear the word of the Lord? And we beg and we plead, Lord, speak to us. And He speaks to us, but we don't listen because we don't have His Word. How does anyone miss a lion's roar? It's a pretty distinct sound, if you've heard it. And God is not a lion who sneaks up in the tall grass. There's something else I've realized about the Lord. He speaks loudly. Oh, I know he spoke in a, in a still small voice to Elijah. Elijah needed a still small voice in that time. But what I'm saying here is across the pages, across the, the landscape of history, God has been a lion loud and clear. He has roared his word forth. He has made it so absolutely evident. He roars. He makes his coming known. He is not like the ghost in the darkness. If you saw that movie several years ago, came out in 1996, The Ghost in the Darkness. It was a movie about a story that happened in 1898. March of 1898, the British began building a rail bridge there over the Sabo River in Kenya. And as all the workers, the Kenyan workers were there, the Brits were there, and they're building this bridge, two male lions began to stalk the workers. Two huge male lions. They they didn't have manes, so they were maneless. (laughs) And they began to stalk these workers, dragging off and devouring at that time 135 men. Can you imagine what nights in the camp of the Kenyans was like at that time? They snuck in quietly. They would attack. You might hear the low growl and then someone screaming and then silence. They snuck in, grabbed their prey and pulled them off. And what those hunters who were hired to come in and kill the lions discovered, when they found the lion's cave, they found bones piled up of men. And they realized the lions were doing this not for food, but for sports. That these were man-eaters. When they finally killed them, the first one they killed was 9 feet 8 inches nose to tail. It took 8 men to carry the carcass back to camp. Because these lions snuck in. And construction obviously was halted. The workers fled. They were, they were terrified as these man-eaters surreptitiously, almost invisibly, hauled off their prey in the dark of the night. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 5.4 You brethren are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So let us not sleep as others do. Let us be alert and sober. Those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't come sneaking up in the night. He has made clear exactly what he's doing. You might say, what about the rapture of the church? And I would say, he has made it clear. He has loudly roared exactly what his plan is, his intentions. The only thing he hasn't said with the rapture is the exact day and time. But there are even hints of that. The lion roars. God roared across Israel. He did not destine Israel for wrath, but for glory, and yet they chose wrath. They chose it for three transgressions and for four. What I'm saying is we should no more be surprised by the lion's roar than the people of Israel should have been surprised. His word has over the centuries literally leapt off the page. In fact, his word did leap off the page in the person of Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah. All the way back in the days of old Jacob, Genesis 49, verse 9, he spoke of Jesus when he prophesied, saying, He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? And we need to know that the lion is going to roar from Zion again. The lion roars at the beginning of the book of Amos. He roars from Zion. The word of the Lord is going out across the land through his prophets. But it's going to happen again. 
If you were with us Wednesday night, you know the prophet Joel used the same analogy of the lion's roar to describe the second coming of Jesus Christ. Joel chapter 3 verse 16. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. We know that's about the second coming because in the first coming, prior to the first coming, the Lord's roar was not a refuge for Israel. It was a driving out of Israel. But in the second case, when he returns, he roars and he is a refuge. Before that day. Before his second coming, the Apostle John saw Jesus in the Revelation. And what he saw there was one who was holding in his hands the power to unleash the wrath of God in the tribulation. Listen to this, Revelation 5, verse 5. John looks and he says, The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, so as to open up the book and its seven seals. What's that all about? Go listen to the Revelation study. You'll understand. But actually, one of the elders there at the time tells John, John is weeping. There's this, there's this scroll with seven seals, and he's weeping because there's no one found who can open it. And the elder tells, tells John, oh, there's someone who can open it. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has the right, purchased with his own blood, to open up this, this book. And when he breaks the seals, that is when Jesus, lion of the tribe of Judah, breaks the the seals he unleashes he opens up the wrath of the lamb that's kind of cool the lion of the tribe of judah is also the lamb of god he is lion and lamb and the lion breaks the seals and opens up the wrath of the lamb i would have called it the wrath of the lion because that sounds a little more fierce what's a lamb going to do you know i don't know what well, how, how does a lamb attack But when the Lamb breaks the seals, and He is the Lamb because He was the sacrifice, and it gives Him the right, when He breaks those seals, Revelation 6 tells us the tribulation gets underway. By the way, side note, some have argued, yeah, but that's not really the tribulation. The tribulation really only starts three and a half years in, and that's when the rapture of the church is going to happen midway through the tribulation. And And I think that's bunk personally. Because at the end of Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, we're told very clearly that it is the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus is in full control. Well, the book of Amos. The book of Amos is the lion's roar. It is a resounding warning of the breaking of Israel at the last straw. But I want you to consider just one other thing this morning as we open this book. I want you to think about the little guy. Number three, the little guy. The little guy. Who is Amos? Who is this guy? He gives us in his book two self-descriptions. The first one is in verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa. There's his resume. There it is right there. Among the sheep herders. Where does this guy get off? Bringing such a heavy, roaring prophecy. I'll tell you where he got off. He got off at the bus station in the hill country of Judea, about 10 to 12 miles south of Jerusalem. A mountainous stronghold, if you will, called Tekoa. His stop was an outpost town. Tekoa means stockade or fort. Tekoa was built originally by Rehoboam as as kind of a, a defense town for Israel, for for Judah, for the southern kingdom of Judah. By the way, just complete side note, I I was looking into Tekoa and placing it on the map. It's in the region right now in Israel today of Gush Etzion. Gush Etzion is a, a region there in the nation of Israel. And if you've noticed this or seen this in the news, this last week, three teenagers are missing. Uh, probably kidnapped by terrorists. In fact, Netanyahu is saying these three teenagers were kidnapped by Palestinian terrorists right out of a hitchhiking post there at Tekoa in Gush Etzion. They were coming home from their yeshiva, their, their Hebrew school, stopping off, hitching. I guess they were hitchhiking posts along the road. They were hitchhiking there. Obviously were picked up and are kidnapped. So be in prayer about that. 
But it's odd. First Chronicles 11.6 tells us, again, Rehoboam built Tekoa as a defense city. And it tells us something about the little guy we need to understand. The prophet Amos was from the wrong nation. He's from Judah. He is of the sheep herders of Tekoa in Judah. He's a Judean. He is not an Israelite, at least not of the northern kingdom. God called someone from the wrong nation. What right do you have coming up here preaching at us? Go back south where you belong. Called from Judah to prophesy to Israel? But there's more. Because as a prophet, not only was Amos from the wrong nation, Amos had zero qualifications. He was not trained in the school of the prophets. He didn't attend Bethel Seminary. He had no formal training, no degrees, no credentials, no significant titles whatsoever. His resume is seriously lacking. He's a shepherd of Tekoa. Tekoa was known for two things, sheep and figs. Which means if you need someone to watch the flock, call Amos. You want someone to bring home some figgy pudding? (laughs) Amos is your guy. But a prophet? No. Turn over to Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7, we get a little story that's the only other biographical sketch in the entire book. Beginning in verse 10. Amos chapter 7, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So he's a false priest. Note that. Jeroboam, when he set up Bethel and Dan, started calling all kinds of priests and not from among the tribes or the tribe of Levi. Just priests from whoever he wanted as a priest. And so here's this Amaziah who is not a priest of the Lord, not assigned by the Lord. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. <laughs> really? This guy's a shepherd. He picks figs. But the land can't endure the roaring that is coming through the mouth of Amos. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. And then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer. Flee away to the land of Judah and there eat bread. And there do your prophesying, but no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. (laughs) You're not clergy, get out. You're not a pastor, you have no basis of speaking. You have no purpose being here. You don't belong, Amos. Go home, go south, eat bread, get out of our face. And then Amos replied to Amaziah, I'm not a prophet, nor am I, quote unquote, the son of a prophet. I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. There's his resume. A herder and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now hear the word of the Lord. You are saying, you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in the city. And your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. And your land will be parceled up by a measuring line. And you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Wow, the shepherd roars like a lion. The the fig picker's got power in his voice. And it is not because of who Amos is or where he's from or what he's done. This man is a man prepared by God, called by God, and filled with the Spirit of Christ. Remember where we started this morning and I was asking you all to consider what is your place? Well, I have no formal training. Neither did Amos. Yeah, but but I I, I have a a completely unrelated, non-religious job. Same with Amos. Are you a fig picker? (laughs) I would imagine more of you have a little higher resume than picking figs. Or working among the flock. 
Did Amos even know when he was being prepared? He's out there picking and grinning. And he's working with his sheep. Did he know that he was in times of preparation? Listen to this. Ironside once wrote, God's way always is to prepare his servants secretly for the work they are afterwards to accomplish publicly. Moses on the backside of the desert. Gideon on the threshing floor. David from among the sheepfolds. Daniel refusing to defile himself with the king's meat. John the Baptist in the desert, Peter in his fishing boat, Paul in Arabia, and Amos following the flocks and picking the figs in the wilderness of Tekoa. That was where his training ground was, not Bethel, not the school of the prophets. And if you ever feel obscure in the church, unnecessary, a side issue, useless... Wait just a fig picking moment. <laughs> Amos was not from among those who you would think God would call. Turning your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. And Paul puts a fine point on this. And as I read this, whether you've heard it before or not, you need to apply it to yourself. Apply it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Stop right there. I want you to look around the room and imagine us first service in the new building, because we won't even fill up half of it. Well, we need to go back to one service so we look more full. We're not going to. Why not? Because we need room. But I want you to imagine in that first time, the the, the first Sunday, we'll give you more info on this as we get closer, but the first Sunday we're going to all gather together and have one big celebration service. It'll be great. The second Sunday, we're going to be right back to two services. Why? Because we need the seats. But Rick, what if we're only a fourth of of all the seats filled? So what? I'm not really concerned about image. I'm, I'm really concerned about openness. For the gospel to be received and people to come. But, you know, look around at us right now. It's like, how much are we really going to fill up that first hour? That's kind of foolish. Foolishness of God is wisdom. It's wiser than men. Verse 26, he says, Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh. Remember, you're thinking about yourself here. Not many mighty. Not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Anyone been there? And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Through an irrelevant shepherd, an insignificant fig picker, a little guy, the lion, roared across Israel. The message of God was loud and clear. Through the voice of this little guy, Amos. And that's the way God does it. That's always the way God does it. Always. Think about this. The lion's roar came through the little guy. What a picture. 
You want further proof of how God chooses His team? Look no further than Jesus Christ. The lions roar through the little guy. He's the lion who became the little guy. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, he existed in the form of God, but he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. A little guy. He's God. He's glorious. He's on the throne. And he says, I'm going to wear human flesh. Kind of like Amos. Well, Jesus wasn't a fig fig picker. No, carpenter. Blue collar either way. Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Jesus was like any other Jew. Walking throughout the streets of Nazareth, the hills of Judea, people would look at him and not think twice. Unless they knew the family. Oh, that's Jesus, Joseph's son. He was despised and forsaken of men, Isaiah writes. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Jesus was the little guy, the lion of Judah. Who became the little guy? Born in a barn? Raised in backwater Nazareth? Trained in the wilderness? Suddenly, he shows up, right? And he's prophesying in Israel. And there are miracles being talked about. And amazing things happen. Someone even said he walked on water. What is going on? Who is this man? And the buzz is throughout the land. Could this be the Messiah? Until John 19 tells us Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. He didn't say, Behold the Messiah. Behold your God. Behold the man. Pilate was trying very hard to make Jesus look every bit the weak, pathetic little guy that Pilate thought he was. The lion who became the little guy. It should have all ended right there. Right there in front of Pilate. In fact, right there during the lashings. Should have ended. On the cross. Should have been over. The little guy taken out by the political and the religious powers of the day. Goodbye. Left to the obscurity of the dusty prophets of the history of Israel. So why didn't it end? Why are we still here? Why did we show up? This morning. Why is the name of Jesus still worshipped? The power of Jesus still sought. The company of Jesus still desired. 2,000 years later. It's for one reason. Acts 4.13. Tells us as the Sanhedrin observed the confidence of Peter and John. And understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Have you been with Jesus? Does that define you? Is that what is declared in your life because you have been with Him? Is that what people see? That's what's required. In days ahead for the Bridge Fellowship. In days ahead for your own personal life. Whether it's in this fellowship or somewhere. Wherever God may call you. Have you been with Jesus? Because if you've been with Jesus Christ. If we walk with Jesus Christ. We have the lion's share of grace. (laughs) Wow. Spencer was telling me. A young lady this last week asked him. What does grace feel like? I don't know of anything that feels better. We have confidence because of Christ. We have power because of Him. It's not in numbers. It's not in abilities. We may be uneducated. We may be untrained. You may think of yourself as ordinary or obscure, but if you have been with Jesus, you have the power to roar the message of the gospel. And it is time for us to roar, gang. We've been in the fold long enough. Time to roar. Who, like Amos, is going to bear a burden to the lost world? 
chapter 3, verse 8 of the book of Amos says, A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? And Father, we pray before you this morning that you will give us the voice of the prophet. That you will, through your people, ordinary, average, normal folk, as we're all gathered here, none better or worse, all coming from different walks of life, but Lord, would you, through the presence and power of Jesus Christ, give us the lion's roar. Give us the message. Give us, Father, the confidence and the power of your Spirit to speak that message. That we might be, in our day, significant in your kingdom. And Father, that every single thing we do would result in praise and honor and power and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.